So here I am. It's uh, Tuesday, September 7th at 10.51 uh, a.m. Low tide is somewhere around noon, right around noon. And uh, I'm checking out this little perched pocket beach. A strange little beach deposit that seems to be perched at the highest level of the highest normal tide, storm tide actually, and I think this whole beach that you're looking at here, bleeding over into the wetland, I think this whole thing is really the result of all this sand and shell and pebbles being washed over by very large storms. Um, I've looked at the aerial photography and starting way back in the 90s, the earliest stuff you can get from Google Earth, you see that this beach deposit was essentially right in front of the marsh out there. And a couple of big storms washed it all the way back here and it's been sort of washing over. Um, and overwashing into the, the upper wetland um, ever since. So you can see these lobes of sand that are pushing their way. I can see that the last high tide, you can see where it's wetted. So the last high tide swash and wetting got all the way up to, <clears throat> all the way up to essentially the top of the toes that are that are washing out into the into the marsh. Now I'd been out here before. I was out before and after uh, Hurricane Henri, and I was sort of hoping against hope that this location would be on the right side of the storm, which would have meant a lot of damage to infrastructure and shelter and whatever. But um, if there's an upside to such a thing, I would have been able to document uh, hurricane surge effect on this beach. So anytime there's a hurricane and it looks like it's going to happen here, or a big winter storm, I'm going to try and get out here and see if I can document how this is happening. So there's a marker that I placed at the nose of that, or near the nose of that overwash lobe. And uh, I've flown the area a couple times with my drone. And um, again, before and after Henri, now we had offshore winds here. We were on the, the left side of the hurricane as it made landfall. So we really didn't get much of a storm effect. Um, the interesting thing about this spot is that if you look out there, you can see that there's the, the shoreline itself is, um, is Spartina alterniflora holding down a marsh mat. And I've been down there at low tide and you can see there's a, a foot and a half scarp and the waves are lapping into it and trying to erode the, the marsh. But it's pretty consolidated. It holds itself together better than sand would. Sand would be moving around instead of the waves. Um, so it's very interesting what's going on here. And I'm, I'm curious to see how fast that marsh edge is eroding with storms. In the meantime, what, it, what you see set up here is uh, a version, a stripped down version of what I I've been calling my marsh innovation camera system. Um, I initially had this elaborate thing with two GoPros, one pointing at a meter stick and the other one pointing at the horizon just to catch the whole thing. And then I set it on time lapse. And I have a sizable battery backup so that it can shoot time lapse images for hours. So I'm down here about an hour and a half, right now an hour and five minutes ahead of predicted high tide and it's I put the I put the nose of that thing or I put the the meter staff stake down at the very nose of this beach deposit. There's a hydraulic step there. You can see the the incoming little squash waves and the outgoing squash waves. Where they meet they usually leave a, a heavier lag deposit, a larger grain size. Um, and also, seaward of that is this flat um, 
Mars platform with a lot of uh, oyster shell and stuff on it. So I'm going to leave this. I'm going to leave this uh, time lapse camera going for the next hour or so and see how deep it gets. Um, right at the nose of this uh, of this beach deposit, but I can also see rack lines. So. And it looks even wet here, so I'm thinking that this is the very last high tide that came in. So, um, new moon was actually uh, yesterday. So, last night would have been the, the high tide, new moon, spring tide. But I looked at the tide charts and it looks like it's going to be a couple inches higher today at noon. Um, or actually yesterday at 11.30 something was predicted um, new moon high tide. So, um, but it looks like it's supposed to be predicted to be a couple inches deeper today. So I have an hour to wait um, before that's going to happen. We'll just see what happens. I'll be monitoring the back side of the marsh and also the front side of the marsh. Okay, catch you later. Okay, a couple other things about this place I noticed that were, it's a bit interesting and, and a bit strange. You can see that the incoming new moon high tide, we're about an hour away from it, is lapping at the toe of this sandy, shelly uh, perch beach deposit. And it's sitting on top of Old Marsh Platform and uh, going seaward to the edge there's a drop off there of about a foot and a half, maybe two feet. Um, at low tide, um, the water levels right at the bottom of that drop off. Waves might be trying to eat into the into the bound, um, really fine, fine grained uh, marsh sediment that's been trapped by the grasses and then bound together as the marsh accretes vertically. But right here, what again, what I'm interested in is. I think this beach deposit is really only moved significantly by strong storm events. You can see that today we've got very little wind, maybe two to four miles an hour coming from the, the west-southwest and um, almost no waves, no wind waves on, on Long Island Sound. But if there was a big hurricane, um, you know, Hurricane uh, uh, or Superstorm Stan Sandy put about eight, nine feet of storm surge um, right here. But it didn't actually happen at high tide. But this would have been completely overwashed, certainly. And I've found, uh, you can look online, there's a couple of storm surge uh, tracking scenarios where you can find how high on the landscape people mapped debris from the storm surge uh, swash. And it was um, right around the corner at Jacobs Beach, it was 9.4 feet. And we are right near there, so easily eight or nine feet uh, above uh, mean sea level. Um, or usually they say eight or nine feet above dry, normal dry ground, which would be actually right here. So nine feet above here would have been taking water all the way back up in there probably right up against those properties back there. Um, but even so, with, with, um, with this jump in elevation to get up onto the marsh platform, um, that would have knocked down some of the waves. The waves would have been breaking for sure. I mean, they're breaking all the time. This is storm, storm waves. They have very short period. They're constantly breaking. And maybe they were three to five feet tall wave from crest to trough here. Um, but there's a number of things that are breaking up um, the incoming surge and wave train, and that would be, well, Faulkner's Island out there, but the waves would have been uh, refracting around that. There's some other um, outcrops and some shallow ledges out there. They would have been knocking down some of the waves. But So by the time it got here, you maybe had 
three feet of breaking wave on top of, I'm just guessing, three feet of breaking wave on top of a surge that was over the top of this. Um, so, and I think that marsh is, uh, like marshes always do, they, they absorb a lot of wave energy. So the wave loses energy in a number of ways. One, when it, when it reaches shallow water, the wave breaks. Um, but also, as it's coming in over something like marsh grass, the marsh grass swaying in the current is actually robbing the wave of energy, the same way that waves breaking on a beach have to lift the sand up, and that takes energy from the wave. So the beach is really one of the best energy absorbers you can have along the shoreline for storm waves. Um, and you can see that clearly in places um, that have had hurricane surge where there was significant beach in front of it versus, versus almost no beach in front of it. It's been documented a number of times, including by uh, colleagues of mine um, during uh, Superstorm Stan Sandy and Irene back in 2011-12 in East Haven and Milford and other places where homes were destroyed. But the ones least, least affected were ones where they had significant beach in front of them, maybe twice as wide as, as this thing. Other houses were essentially on stilts, right, right in, the, right at the high tide line, and they got hammered by, you know, again, you had nine feet of storm surge, you had waves breaking right through the lower floor of these houses, and they were completely destroyed. But so this is an interesting one. I'm curious to see um, what a big storm would do here. Um, I've mapped a couple of these locations that I call a little perched beach. And um, I looked all the way from Massachusetts, following Cape Cod down, the Rhode Island shore, the Connecticut shore, New Jersey shore. I went all the way down to Georgia, and I and there I only found significant little pocket beaches here, maybe one or two in Delaware, on the Delmarva Peninsula, um, and then but a number of them in Guilford. Now Guilford's not known for its beaches. The only significant beach is an artificially nourished one called Jacob's Beach around the corner. Cost them a lot of money every 10 years to truck in sand and rebuild that beach. It's a major recreational site. And then there's a half a dozen of these small, this is the biggest one, half a dozen of these little perch beaches. There's one, there's two more around the corner over there. But there's a couple on um, to the east of me as well. And they're all in a situation like this where it looks like there's a storm beach deposit that only is getting wet at the highest high tides and it's only getting moved around during storms and it's perched on top of a marsh platform. Now perch beaches have been talked about all over the world. Um, most of them are sitting on really hard substrate like like a, a carbonate platform or something like that and even you know behind engineering structures they they try and protect a, a beach and keep it sort of perched above the wave action. But this is a natural perch beach with a very interesting scenario because it's got marsh in front of it. I've only found a couple of places in the literature that talk about a scenario like this. So this is a unique one. Plus, I think it's important for the, the town of Guilford and their conservation um, plans to protect or at least recognize this beach is here. This might be a suitable place for um, plovers to lay their eggs. It's certainly a nice place to walk versus walking in the in the marsh. A lot of people bring their dogs and out here and walk along or or pitch a beach chair and hang out here. It's a beautiful, quiet place. So I consider it a, a natural resource for the town of of Guilford. The other ones that are around the corner, they're sort of little teeny things. They're maybe only 100, 150 feet long and, and 30 feet wide or something like that. They're just little perched beach deposits sitting on top of marsh. Um, anyway, interesting stuff. I'm going to stop for now, come back at noon, and check our inundation camera.
So I'm standing at the west end of this first little uh, perched uh, pocket beach, and um, there's other things I want to I want to investigate here. One is what is the beach made of? What is the material that the beach is made of? I see that there's a ton of shell, and I'll show you all this shell material here. And they're fairly, these shell materials, fairly large uh, size compared to the, compared to the sand and, compared to the sand that's in here. So this is granule size and very coarse sand. There's some pebbles in here as well. Here's a pebble size rock. So it takes fairly high energy to leave this stuff behind. Um, the very much finer sediment um, is uh, mixed in here as well, and also all over the all over the mud flat and the marsh platform. But this is fairly high energy uh, deposit. Now the reason the shells are so much bigger than the than the uh, other um, rock fragments and coarse sand and granules and pebbles is that um, the shells are fairly lightweight, but they're large. So they act as if they are um, a smaller, they act as if they're a smaller grain size because of their, their density is so low. But they have a large surface area, so the, the waves um, and the current can flip them around pretty easy. So you often find fairly coarse shell with finer grained um, sand. Anyway, let's take a walk and look at this a little bit better. Here's this last um, new moon high tide, which was yesterday. There's a rack line for it. You can clearly see it's a little bit wet still on the seaward side of it. You can see some dog tracks walking along there. That was probably sometime earlier this morning or late yesterday afternoon because high tide was at high tide was um, about 11 30 or so 11 40 yesterday today it's right at noon and we are it's 11 17 so still got 45 minutes of inundation going on anyway I will catch you up in a bit you can see here in this area there's Spartina patens. It's this. It's this uh, finer, finer um, grass that uh, often gets um, laid down and swirled around. What they call cowlick uh, pattern, and then you see the more vertical standing Spartina alterniflora. The alterniflora can handle much more salinity, so you really only ever see the Spartina patens sort of perched. You can see this one little perched area cowlick area, it's above and surrounded by Spartina alterniflora. And this area is already getting uh, flooded by the incoming tide from the back side. So it's come in around and flooding in the back side of the, the wetland. Here's a classic little area of Spartina patens. You see the cowlick laid down by the wind and the current and then you see the higher standing Spartina running in the line. That looks like that's an old um, uh, marsh uh, channel that was dug way back in the 1940s. They channeled most of the marshes along the east coast of the U.S. to try and get them to drain faster. They were worried about mosquito breeding in standing water and uh, worried about malaria, but we pretty much eradicated that, although it might come back. Um, but anyway, um, many efforts have been made to try and block these channels. We want the marsh grass to hold on to the water longer so that there's more opportunity for the fine grain sediment to settle out in and among the, the marsh grasses, and that's what helps it keep up with sea level rise. But here you see one of those channels you very rarely see straight lines in nature, and that's a that's a drainage channel. It would have drained the water out there, hook up with another channel to go around the corner, and then drain off 
into Long Island Sound. This channel is already flooding. Spartina alternate floor coming all the way up to the nose of this um, this little gravel lobe that is part of this beach. So this is one of these landward prograding storm overwash lobes. I've seen storm overwash in many places on the East Coast and this is classic because it's just a little microcosm of it. So here's here's another larger storm wash lobe and you see one of my ground control points that I place for my drone. So it's just a an aluminum stake. It's covered in plastic so it won't rot and then I've got a CD-ROM slung over it sitting on the marsh surface and my drone can see that and I can lock that in on a, on a whole number of pictures that see that spot so I can more precisely correct for any um, any inaccuracies in the GPS positioning of any one individual drone position when it took a picture. It's amazing so your your drone GPS is no better than your phone GPS um, which basically has an error ball of maybe six feet or something like that at the best. So you would think that all the drone pictures taken up in the air, um, there's error, six feet of error in all three directions, maybe even more in the vertical for each one of those. So how the heck are you going to get an accurate um, ortho mosaic or stitched image from all that? But it turns out the structure for motion software does this really unique iteration after iteration after iteration trying to to adjust the camera where it had to be in the sky to see that common point on the ground and uh, and as it does that it, it repositions all the cameras and gets them into a better uh, positioning so that it better resolves the common scene position of that ground control point or whatever the feature is and this is why it takes like you know, if you've got a couple hundred pictures, it can take eight hours on a on a um, on a even a pretty good laptop, 16 gigabytes of RAM and a NVIDIA or Core i7 uh, processor. But I have a bigger machine with 128 gigs of RAM, super fast graphics processor. It could do that work in in a matter of a maybe a, just a couple of hours versus like half a day or more. Anyway, it's pretty amazing how this structure for motion works and I'm going to be using it on mapping this um, perched beach deposit as much as I can. I'm probably not going to fly a mapping mission today because I just did a week or so ago at neat below tide. So the only, there's been no storms there hasn't been, this is the first high tide since Henri and there's really calm weather now. So I don't expect to, there to be really any modification to this beach really at all. Um, I mean these, uh, these little teeny waves, you know, a couple centimeters high lapping at the, lapping at the toe of this beach deposit are you know, barely rolling around um, the sand grains. Oh, here's something interesting. You can see where the back, where the back running swash, where the, the swash that's, that's running back off the beach meets the incoming little wavelet, the sand is coarser there. Um, that's that hydraulic step or that coarse lag deposit that's migrating up and down the toe of this beach. It's normally set at the toe of the beach where the, where the sand meets the stable marsh platform. But here you can see the wave action affecting it right here. And here is my marsh in inundation camera system. It's 1125. I hope the camera is still going. And the water line is right where the camera is staked out right now. And the depth of inundation at the toe of this feature looks like right now it's about 27 centimeters. 27 centimeters. So we'll see how much deeper it gets. I'm hoping that the water will come up 
um, all the way up to this last high tide rack line right in right in here that last high tide rack line was maybe last night I'm hoping we can see some of that so you can see this uh, marsh channel and you can see there's some water in it already creeping up and I am just on this lobe where I position one of my ground control points and the water is just about eight centimeters below it or so but I'm hoping this gets flooded um, at least sees a little bit of at least sees a little bit of water um, it should because last time it looks like the water came right up to that edge and the water is already showing up over here where you have, excuse me, where you have uh, this little landward migrating lobe of sand and shell deposit. And you see there's Spartina all around that and patents above it. Something else I want you to notice about what's happening with this beach is um, the change in grain size when you go across it. So I mentioned it's, it's always a little bit coarser right under where the swash is taking place. But then actually it's coarse all the way up until this high tide line and above that. But on the top of the beach, this area that has vegetation growing in it. This is a dune, this is a small little dune patch. And this is much finer sand. Much finer sand. This is uh, medium to fine sand, not, not that well sorted. Um, and it's really poorly sorted down, down in here. It's got all kinds of grain size, but mostly fairly large. Coarsest of sand small granules, little pebbles, shell. And then up here, it's finer sand. And mainly in this section right here, you can see the vegetation dies out a little bit in the middle part. But up in here, this is functioning as a, as a dune. The very finer sand that may be mixed in on the, on the beach face here, um, it, when it dries out, it's being blown up into this top area where the grasses are catching it and you're getting a little bit of a dune built in, but it's very thin. And then you work your way over to the back side and it looks like if there's any wind blowing to sand here, it's carrying it into the marsh and certainly the, the storm swash is carrying it in um, along with all the coarser grain material. But that's interesting. I, sort of overlooked that the fact that there's a little bit of it's a little bit of much finer grain sand here in this section so this is a little it's a little dune cap it's probably only a few tens of centimeters thick I'll check that out later okay so now it's uh, 1144 so about 15 minutes from high tide and I'm sort of right near this rack line. Um, and it's, it's got another 15 minutes, so it'll probably make it up. Here's something that I just noticed only with the water lapping up against it. You see this, you see this undulating line of, uh, of a little bit higher standing beach material and the swash coming in these are these are little beach cusps it's that's crazy I love beach cusps um, but on a tiny scale and here's what's interesting you can see that they're winding up concentrating the shell material 
in each little embayment. So here's a cusp node. There's a cusp nose here. One here, one there. And right offshore of the little embayment is a much higher concentration of shell happening right in the swash zone. Here's another example with concentrated shell. So it looks like the uh, little little bit of wave refraction is causing higher breaking uh, ripples right in there and is pulling the shell material into those areas. Really bizarre. But something you see on much larger scale. These these little cusps are only about a meter apart, a meter and a half apart maybe, two meters at most. I've seen them on big beaches, on really big beaches I've seen these cusps that are, you know, 120 feet apart or, you know, 60 meters apart, something like that. But you can clearly see them, little cuspate forms going down the beach. And here we are at 11.46. Hopefully the time lapse is still going on. <coughs> I'll walk out here. I've got some great little boots. And now I'm seeing that we are at, uh, what, 32 centimeter inundation. I hope that stake isn't sinking, but 32 centimeters deep at the, 32 centimeters deep at the nose of this beach, where this beach deposit ends at the, at the old marsh platform that starts. We'll wait another 20 minutes or so. Actually, I'm going to wait another hour, see if I catch the tide beginning to recede. See down the beach here, the highest wetted line is almost at the uh, last high tide swash where that old rack line is. And I think these little waves that you're seeing here are probably boat wakes generated way out there somewhere. Um, see they're coming in. I got about three seconds, two and a half, three seconds between the, the little wave crests. And they're maybe three or four centimeters tall where they're plunging right there. Cool. One more thing about beach cusps. You, um, you rarely see these on a beach that doesn't have some kind of bounding um, edge to it, like a, a little reef promontory on either side. And um, it's not really precisely known, but it, there's, a, there's a phenomenon called edge waves, where the waves coming in, if they're bounded on both sides, they can set up uh, a seashing from side to side the whole and it, and it happens over a much longer period than the individual waves coming through but it can be higher here and then higher there and higher here and higher there that in combination with the with the uh, incoming swash can start initiating this beach cusp formation and you often see them die out toward the toward the bounding edge as you can see there but they're really well developed right through here and then right through there, and then they die out, heading back toward the other end of this bound little beach. Crazy. Here's another question for you. So you see the standing water on the back side of this beach deposit going into the marsh, and there is, there is a marsh channel. You can see it going off in that direction. So the high, t the high tide, um, incoming tide is coming way around the corner up into it races up into these marsh channels and here it is on the back side of this beach deposit so curious you might think well how does the water level there compare to the water level out at the front of the beach shouldn't they be the same elevation the tide is coming in Shouldn't it be just as high on the front of this as on the back of this? And if so, what if we could cut a line right underneath it and we could figure out 
how much of this beach is standing above normal new moon spring tide or full moon spring tide. So that would be the permanently subaerial or above water level portion of the beach. Now it's clear though that that this high tide won't make it all the way up to this backside rack line. So I'm thinking that this backside rack line was from some previous significantly higher tide and material washed in from the backside and built up against this. I can't imagine why water coming over the top would decide to leave the the rack there when it's deeper over here. Why wouldn't it just carry it into there? So I don't know what's exactly what's going on, but I, my feeling is this is a backside rack line and there is a significant elevation change, maybe five centimeters or so till you get to the sloping top of the beach. And then you have this little teeny patch of much finer sand that I'm calling incipient dune. Um, and then it goes down and here's a significant Here's a, a rack line that must have been at a very high tide. Maybe that rack line coincides with that rack line over there at some much higher high tide or even a, one of the last significant storms to actually do much work on this beach. Because um, it really starts to, that's about, that's about the highest point on the whole beach. And then just down from that, a couple centimeters down is where this rack line is. And then it gently slopes. I don't have a slope meter, but um, looks like it's just sloping a couple of degrees down to right about here, where the normal um, spring tide um, rack line is. And then it, and then the slope increases significantly to maybe um, three or four degrees um, down to the down to the step. Or the very bottom of this uh, of this intertidal zone right here, where the platform starts. Cool. Okay, we are just five minutes away from high tide. I am going to stay out here and see if I can catch the tide going out again. But we are uh, getting close to max inundation. There may be a bit of a lag. Um, the high tide time I'm reporting is from Guilford Harbor which um, is a calculated um, tide height. I don't think there's a true tide gauge there, but there might be. Um, the real significant tide gauge is way over in West Haven and another one, New London and Bridgeport. But they're able to calculate the, when the high tide would hit an area like this. And uh, there's always a little change in, in, the, in the timing of the highest high tide at different places along the shoreline, but they say it's exactly 12 noon around that corner over there in Guilford, Guilford Harbor. Um, so that should be roughly the same time, 12 noon exactly, high tide here. Okay, so by my watch, it's about 20 seconds from from uh, noon here. And oh, cool! Watch this. It's an osprey up there hunting around. That's pretty cool. There's a good, it's a solid osprey family here. But anyway, okay, so now it's noon. And we're going to see, you can actually see that the high tide is the swash is right about at that last high tide swash. In fact, it's already remobilized some of that rack. 
and it's going to set it up again looking back that way it's at the last high tide swash line same elevation so let's check here the depth on our marsh inundation camera so my boots are just about five inches from overtopping but that is looking like it's 34 it's dropping down 33 36 that's with the little waves coming in there's a way you can stop that if I put a big a wide like um, six inch diameter PVC pipe that had holes cut in it um, so that water could get in the water line inside the PVC pipe up against the staff the, the meter staff would not move around anywhere near as much as as the waves are doing but anyway that's looking like it's a sort of between waves we're at about 34 centimeters deep right there now here's my marsh inundation camera. Hopefully it's still going. It was set on time lapse. I'm gonna let that go for another hour and see what happens. See if there's a significant delay between the calculated high tide at Guilford and the high tide as manifest on the beach here. Also, interestingly, you know, I mentioned before about the idea that um, the water level at high tide here on the beach face um, is it the same as the water level at the same time on the back side of the the marsh so and I can see right here that there is some water creeping up the back side of this little this little uh, prograding overwash lobe but I'm thinking like in most wetland systems, it takes a while, it takes a while for the tide to make it in to the wetland, up through the channels and flooding in and among all the marsh grasses. Um, I know that at the Cove River site that I mapped, that's about uh, almost a kilometer inland from the mouth of the Cove River, it takes almost an hour for the high tide pulse to reach that spot going in and around all the channels and through the stuff and so there, there can be a significant delay in when the high tide hits and we also need to look think about that at our um, East River Audubon site we are quite a bit we're a couple of kilometers from the coast over a vast uh, wetland system and we usually try and fly it at uh, we usually try and get down there at a neap low tide because um, that would be in the middle of the day um, and uh, and yeah I don't know what the delay there is for the the low or the high tide compared to Guilford Harbor where the, the tide is calculated at anyway so here we are at my my backside overwash lobe ground control point and just landward of that is this marsh channel that's full of water and I think the water is just beginning to creep up it's saturating the soil and the sand right around here but the ground control point as it stands is still is still dry so um, but I think the water level should come right up near it so that means there's probably there's probably a delay in the timing of the highest tidal reach on the front side versus the back side of the marsh. That's typical, anyway. Okay, I'm going to quit for now. I don't know if my eyes are deceiving me, but I, I think the water is higher over here than it is over here. And remember, the tide has to come in and around and flood from the back side. So there is, I'm, I, I'm just judging from my own eyes, but I think there is a bit of a delay in the, in the highest high tide reaching the back side here. We'll check it out.
Okay, there's some kind of little uh, plover here. Don't know if that's a piping plover. It's right on the beach there, running around. He goes flying away a little bit. I didn't see him mimicking. I didn't see him mimicking any struggle. So they will do that and to draw you away if they if they think you're a predator going after eggs. But we're way after egg laying season. But here I am on the the western edge of this little perched beach, and um, this is where this is where the water coming over this very low-lying section of the beach and moving into the wetland. There are some other even lower-lying areas over there in the distance where water is getting in through some of the main channels on the marsh, but this is one. And just to reiterate which way the tide is going, you can see right here You can see right here, I'm going to drop a feather in, and you can see the feather getting stuck. But it's essentially moving landward. So let me throw a couple of other little sticky sticks in there, and the water is moving into the marsh still. So the tide is still coming up, at least here, and still flowing into the, into the marsh. So this is a good place for me to monitor. I'm going to stay here until the tide water starts draining the other way. Then I'll know I've hit high tide, slack, and slack tide. This, this process of water flowing through this little area should change and the water should start flowing backwards into the into Long Island Sound. So this is a pretty cool little location to track the timing of high tide. Right now it's at 1217, so we're 17 minutes past high tide as calculated for Guilford Harbor. And it's still coming in here a bit, which leads me to believe that it's still coming in a bit way down the beach there where my monitoring station is. Okay, now I look, I see a seagull probably eating on a fiddler crab. There's all kinds of little crabs and stuff roaming around in, in this material. So, so this is a pretty good, pretty sweet spot. The tide is still coming in here. see a little bit of sheen washing in on the high tide and here's that feather I dropped in uh, a while ago it's worked its way <coughs> into the marsh here I'm still at this little western edge um, place and I can see when I drop that feather in that it is still ever so slowly floating inland. So at 1234, the tide is still slowly coming in. So I'm going to leave this little feather here, leaning up against these little pieces of grass, and the tide is still coming in really, really slow. So just, you know, a centimeter or so every second or two. And when that, when that feather starts drifting back to the left offshore, I know that we will have passed high tide. So even though it's half an hour after calculated high tide at Guilford, it's still coming in here ever so slowly. I think we are just about at high tide though. Now 
now you can see this little patch of bubbles is starting to go offshore. So I'm going to liberate this feather, place it right out here, and now it is beginning to flow offshore. It's going out to sea. So we just at 1235, we reached high tide, it turned slack for just a minute or so, and now it's going back out to sea. There it goes. So the tide is now going back out. We are past high tide. So I'm going to walk the beach, starting on the back side, because I still think it's the water, the pulse of water from the tide. Um, you know, it's not, it's not just an even bathtub ring that comes across the whole area, that just comes in. Topography in the seafloor can like pile it up around obstacles that can get piled up. So it's not totally consistent. But it was calculated at 12 o'clock, right at Guilford, to be at high tide. And yet, around the corner behind me, I was still watching the waters come in at 12, 12, 35, when it switched. It died down to just about nothing, and then the water started draining. But I have a feeling the tidal pulse may be still trying to work its way in over here, and that we might see the tide's still rising a bit before it then retreats back down. And on the front side, it should be well retreating already. So I'll be over there in a second. I'm just gonna walk this edge. Okay, I'm right near one of my ground control point markers. Here is a good marsh channel there's an egret way off in the distance. So my feeling is that the water pulse, tidal pulse is still working its way in. It just switched around a couple of minutes ago, right at the shoreline. Um, and right here, here's my ground control point. You can see it there, that stake. And um, the, the soil around it, the sand is is dampened, it's wettened. So I don't know if that's water seeping in, capillary action through all the sand grains, but very close by, very close by is water in the, in the wetland. You can see that right there. So there's water right there. There's water all the way out and there's that that marsh channel and then here's my stake in the ground right here and the soil around it or the sand around it is dampened so I don't know if that's capillary action making it through because the water is just a couple of centimeters below it so we shall see if it gets any higher back here I'm not sure Working our way along. Here's water up the back side of these overwash deposits. That's Spartina altiniflora. That usually is growing at the lower elevation. So water right among it is normal. There's no water right among this Spartina patens here because it's just sitting a little bit above. Oh, whoops, spoke wrong. There's some water right there. There's some water right at the edge, right there. I keep hitting the wrong number, but so it's definitely wetted along the toe of these overwash bands, and sometimes right in the the node between them. So there's some mixture of Spartina, Altiniflora, and Patens, and there's water right at the base of that. And here it is again, water right at the base, and water right at the base of this. And I don't know if that's still coming in, but 
we shall see. Here's another one of my markers right there and it's right at the edge of one of these overwashed lobes and surrounded by Spartina patens and the ground is wet there so I think that's getting some of this high tide. Here's my primary ground control point on this one of the landward most lobes and there's water right behind it right in there and there's a nice marsh cut channel coming right there so the water's right there at the edge it's dry where the ground control point is but um, it's wet right around the edges okay so now if I swing around and take you across the beach we'll walk right up to where my uh, marsh inundation or beach inundation camera setup is and you'll see that indeed the high water line is now stranded so the those cusps are now above where the highest swash is coming. So this is beyond high tide. That's funny that it just funneled into that corner over there and it was still pushing into the marsh while it was already beginning to drain down here. So a while ago, this was deeper already. Let's go out and look exactly where how deep it is on this camera of this system right here. So we have water level at right around 27, 26 and a half, 27, 26 centimeters. I think it was 34 centimeters at its highest. Maybe it got a little higher than that. Um, but okay, so success. I'm gonna let this go, keep going a little bit until I see whether the water on the backside of the marsh actually continues to get a little bit higher. So I'm gonna go back and, and watch that for a little bit. Otherwise, success. We documented a new moon, spring tide, very little wind. So this should be a normal um, spring tide height. Now the wind was coming from the west, but only, you know, five miles an hour or so. But that does actually have an effect. Um, you know, it's that Coriolis effect. Wind over water can wind up actually pushing in the northern hemisphere. There's a slight right hand push to that water, which would actually be pushing the water a little bit offshore. I don't know how much that's going to um, affect what's going on here. I doubt it. Maybe a half a centimeter or so. I mean, there's really not enough wind to generate that Coriolis right hand push. But let's go back here and look at, we'll just set up and look at our backside marsh markers and see if they get any wetter than they were. Okay, so I'm on the backside of this beach near some of these overwash lobes. And there's a low cut area where there's some Spartina alternaflora, and you can see the water at the base, right down in here. Now what I've done is I've placed a little bivalve shell right there at the edge of the water. And I'm gonna watch that and see if the water comes any higher. Or when it starts going lower. So it is, what time is it? 12.48 right now. That's right at the water's edge. Let's see if it goes up or down from there. And then I'll know I'm past high tide on the backside of the marsh. 
So I'm at that location where I put that feather and it just started flowing out to sea. And here you can see the feather left high and dry. The water is flowing seaward still. So now the tide is going out. Here, I'll drop that feather in. So it's dropped down a couple centimeters already. There goes that feather floating out to sea. That feather in the water it's gonna get stuck right there, but the water's going out. We have a nice little friend, a seagull friend here in the water. It's okay, gully gully. So the water is down already a centimeter or so on this side where I was monitoring how it was flooding in up to a half an hour after calculated high tide at Guilford. Um, so one thing, I, and you know, my supposition is that it takes a while for the water, for that tidal pulse of high tide to work its way back through the marsh. And if you think about it, what makes water flow is an elevation change at the, at the water surface. So if it's higher here than here, the water's gonna flow that direction. If the tidal pulse is coming in and it gets held up by trying to work its way through marsh, you may have a build it, the tidal pulse build up. It's still trying to work its way in. At the same time, behind the tidal pulse, it may be draining back out. So the tidal pulse may never maximally reach the highest high tide because it's still working its way in when it's already feeling the pull backward. Um, I've never really seen that explained very well, but that makes sense to me. That if it takes a while for the high tide pulse to get in, maybe the highest high tide pulse never gets in because just by the time it's trying to reach its highest level, it's already being pulled back out through the, the channel to the, the wetland edge. So let's go back over here and see if we can see whether the water level has come up on my little makeshift markers. So I put I put a a shell and then I put a little twig at the at the water level on the back side of this beach at a couple of locations and I'm just gonna hopefully I can find them again because I might be able to tell whether it's still coming up on the back side of the marsh or whether the tide pulse is going back the other way again. So let me search for it a little bit. I'll catch you up in a second. Okay, so here I am standing at one of these seaward lobes. And you can see the Spartina alternaflora roots there and you can see the water level. And hopefully you can see this little stick here. This little stick right there. So I placed that right at the water's edge and it looks like the water's dropped down just a hair from there. So maybe it's past high tide on the back side of the marsh. Let me go over here and find that other one I put out. If I can find that. Feathers are good to stick in the sand and watch the flow. Okay, here it is. So here's this other one right here. So again, I'm at the back side of this wetland and I've put a little shell right at the water's edge there, right here, top of that shell. And the water's drained back maybe a couple of millimeters from there. So we are already past high tide on this marsh, on the back side of it. And it is 12.56. So there was a lag for sure for the water to get up here on the back side of this wetland. And I can still see it's still pretty high. 
in these channels, but I think we've caught the peak and it should be draining back. Cool. Well, let's walk over and check one last check on my marsh and beach inundation camera setup. Walking along, you can see the water level is significantly down. It's maybe, I don't know, 20 or 30, 20 centimeters down from its peak on the beach face. You can definitely see the highest wetted line. So that's where the little waves are coming up. And now let's walk out and check it out. So we are down to right around 19 or 20 centimeters inundation. Okay, we're an hour after calculated high tide. Cool. So that's it. I'm going to go back and process this data and think about it some more. Later.